Okay, welcome back to the workshop. So in the last episode, we got these weight covers sorted out down here to stop the chips going into this lower section. And in this episode, I really want to try and get the, this cover sorted out at the back here to protect uh, the rails, the ball screw and the brake mechanism. So those are all covered from the majority of chips anyway. So as you can probably see, I've got a little piece of rubber sheet here. I've got it mocked up, just clamped onto the back there, playing around with a few different ideas because you can draw lots of different things in CAD. You can have a look at other machines, but really, I think for something like this, it's got to move in multiple dimensions and it's a material that's going to move. It's going to bow out when it's in certain positions. It's really probably just best to mock up the idea and then make sure it's going to work on the actual machine. So the way this one's going to work is, um, well, there's a couple of ideas. One was to run it straight up there and there'll be a plate up here that moves up and down with the quill. We'll show you that in a minute. Um, but that, in this idea, it would go on like that and then this moves backwards and forwards. Now that's okay for the back and forth, but when this goes up and down, this tends to bow out like that. And I think it's just going to get in the way of the, anything you're drilling here and just get a bit annoying. So I'm going to do it differently and just roll it back on itself like that. And then that will be screwed onto a plate that moves up and down with the quill. So the idea is that when you're moving the quill up and down like that, this mechanism is connected to a plate at the back. This is connected to that. So then this will just go up and down like that. Uh, and then equally, when the table goes up and down, it will just sort of roll back on itself and hopefully keep it out of the way. And then when the table moves forward and backwards, it will just swing forward like that. And I think it'll also be clear. So I think you can see on here, this needs to be probably another 100 mil longer just to be on the safe side. So I'll order in a, a longer bit, but uh, and this is two millimeter. Let's just check that. I think this is, yeah, two millimeter rubber sheet. So again, I also wanted to order a bit just to get a bit of a feel for how bendy it was going to be, whether it was too rigid or if it was too thin, I thought it was going to rip. So I think two mil, you could probably get away one and a half as well, but two mil feels about right. Okay. So just to remind you the way this top piece is going to work, I've got this, this is 20 millimeter thick plate. Uh, and this was the piece, I ordered this a long time ago, but that was basically going to go on to there. So this will be machined shape, drilled, um, counterboard to accept these, these hole patterns here. So that will go on to there. Um, and then there was another 20 millimeter plate that would come out that was quite wide and would grab around the quill here. And the idea is, because these have a very small amount of uh, movement in the ball there, there is a little set screw you can use to tighten it up, but it's not very satisfactory. So the idea is that was to keep the quill hopefully running in line with the rails, which were in line with the table, to try and keep some accuracy there. Now, uh, this will also have um, some little triangular support brackets, again, 20 mil plate. So it should be reasonably stiff and give a good secure connection to that. Now, when you then move the quill up and down, obviously this whole assembly goes up and down. So when you do that, this will move as well on the rails. And the idea was there'd be a little plate down here that this would then screw into, as you can see, it's a little bit short. So this will kind of move up and down like that as you're drilling holes. So that is the basic idea. And then when the table moves this way, so imagine that up there. That's also fine because this just uh, it can just swing around. And as you can see, it's not really so. There's the, there's the max travel somewhere around there. There we go. You can see it's not really long enough, but I think it's good enough to try out the basic idea. So what we need to do is drill and tap. We'll take this off, drill and tap to accept some M5 fixings because there'll be a little plate here that kind of clamps this on. So let's get started on that.
while we're here I'll point out that the thing that stops it going any further that way is the brake there and um, because we're going to add a little bit of material on the back so we'll have the thickness of the rubber sheet on the back there that will push it out 2 mil, and then there's going to be a, a plate on the back of there just to retain it, it's another 2 so we're losing 4 mil of travel so I may remake this as a kind of rectangular shape so a lot shallower uh, then I'll have to sort of machine up or make a spacer that goes in between so we can still pinch it up um, and then we can take it back basically flush with the rails and that gives us a bit more travel in Y. So we'll have a look at that sometime in the future but for now let's get over to the table. Okay I've got it over here on my marble plate. Now as I've mentioned many times before this is not a surface plate but it's the flattest thing I've got and I think for what we want just some holes so we can mount a bracket it will be fine. So I've just got it up on these blocks so we don't squash the um, uh, the lead screw there or the ball screw because that's a little bit lower so we've got that on both sides they're about the same size so we've got it pretty flat and then we'll just mark out these holes so they need to be 10 mil from this datum here Okay, although it looks like we're back to square one again, we've actually got the holes drilled and tapped around the back here now. That will hold that guide plate on, that will guide the rubber protective sheet. So, progress. And before we go too much further, we'll put this limit stop that we made in the last episode on. Uh, so that will stop the wax is coming too far this way and then damaging the reed head by trying to push it too far along there. So it's just a bit of mild steel turned up and then we cold blued it stop it rusting. I still haven't ordered a little mushroom socket cap screw for that but I will do. That should limit the travel up to there. And you can see the, the reed head doesn't run out of travel here. Now I did have a comment about whether I could slot these or slot this, move the whole thing along and get more travel here. Um, there's not a lot of point in doing that because at this position here uh, the drill is almost hanging over the edge of the table so in theory if you had a piece of work that hung over th that far to make use of this extra room when you went in again it would just hit the back of the machine so you, you know you'd be limited one end to the other so I decided let's just limit it so that it can just reach all of the table as it currently is and then uh, we'll see how we get on. Okay, next up we're going to make the little pieces that hold the bellows on, so there'll be a lower cover plate, that's relatively simple, just a plate with a couple of holes, so I won't bother showing that, but we'll machine that and I'll show you what it looks like. And then the upper one, that's a little bit more interesting because it's got some uh, some bends in it, and we'll be needing to put some rib nuts in there. Now this drawing's useful, it's indicative, but um, all it really shows you is the angles that these two sort of tabs bits have got to be bent to. Obviously this view here is not the complete shape you could cut out because it's viewed at a bit of an angle it's got that slope to it so that drawing is good just to show you how it goes together and how to bend it but what we actually need then is this one and this is basically that same shape but it's unfolded into a flat so this is the true dimensions now and then we've got the cam profile for that now you can also see down in each of these corners I've got a little three millimeter hole that I've cut out and then that gives me a nice convenient point to say where I'm going to bend it when I align it into the sheet metal folder. And I think that's kind of about it. Yeah, so we've got this stock 2mm aluminium set up on the CNC machine. So let's cut it out.
Right, well, that wasn't too successful, was it? So this is what can happen when you cut this thousand grade aluminium. It's almost pure aluminium, so like 99%, 99.9 or something like that. And it does love to gum up the cutter. And I think just as I was getting started on that cut and it was ramping down, I did hit feed hold, but I think I panicked and pressed it twice. So I'll have to look at the replay, but it did feed hold and then it carried on and it dug in. Now, yeah, it snapped a bit. Okay, I could put a new bit in, but it also moved this base piece now I did have some blockers but I didn't have anything blocking it going that way so what I've done is just put the three millimeter drill bit back in again and then loaded up the g-code for that found a few a couple of holes um, and then just made sure just moved it back into position so that the drill definitely goes into the holes again and I've picked a couple just a different position so I know it's all square and all aligned so we're back in position luckily it's not super critical you know it's just a bracket we got back again so we'll load up and put the six millimeter cutter back in and then we'll go again. This time, make sure we've got plenty of coolant. Watch the feed rate as we ramp in. Uh, might even lift the Z a little bit, just so the first skim's not so deep. And then we'll take it from there. Right, let's get going again. And after a bit of cleaning up, that's the upper bracket cut out. We've still got to open up some of the holes and bend it, but before we do that, let's go make the lower bracket. Yeah, and here's the lower one cut out cleaned up and then i've opened up these holes so this is the one that goes at the top and it holds the rubber cover it's got to put some bends in it and i've got to open up these holes a bit and then this one goes at the bottom on the xy table so it it sort of covers the gap in between so let's go and see if this fits on the xy table okay it's a bit awkward i can't quite Somewhere around there. You could probably got a better shot than I have. I can't see what I'm doing. Although if I look in the camera. Ah. Good news is it fits.
Okay. That's a bit tight, but I think it's going to go, yeah. Alright, well I won't do it all the way up because we've got to sandwich the rubber piece in here and I haven't drilled the holes in that yet or sort of pinch the holes through that or cut them in. Uh, right, so let's do the upper bracket. Okay, so before we bend it I'm just going to open these up to 7mm because we're going to put some rivnuts in here when it's finally done. If you've not seen rivnuts before, uh, I'll show you those a bit later in the video and the tool you can use to install those. Uh, but basically what they are is a nice way to put a thread in an otherwise very thin material. They're not ultimate holding strength, but for what we need, I think they'll be fine. And there's other types of nut type solutions available, but I'm pretty familiar with rivnuts and how they work, so we'll go with that for this, and I think it will be fine. So let's drill them out to seven millimeters, and then we can get bending it. Now it would have been great to use the step drill for this, it's perfect for thin materials, but it only goes up in two, so you've got two, four, six, eight, and for this we needed seven, so we're using the drill. They're not perfectly round holes, but it'll be fine for what we need because we'll put the rivet in and it'll clamp it up fine. And then the rivet will sit flush. Okay, I've got my sheet metal folder set up in the vise now, so we're going to make these bends. Now I was just double, triple checking, I don't know if you can see the drawing there, that I'm going to get the two bends correct. So what I've just done is just lightly, I don't know if you can see that, just lightly marked it uh, on those bend lines there. And then to put U for up, so this surface is going to come up, and then on the other side, across there, and then U up for there. And then I've worked out the order I can do it, because if I do it in the wrong order, uh, I can't get this back in to do the second bend. So. The first one we'll do is the really long one there. And we'll just get it lined up onto that line. Let's clamp that down there and see what that looks like. Okay, I can't go too tight because it's suspended with nothing underneath there, so I'm clamping that down. Right, let's just measure that gap, make sure we're on it, and then we'll put the bend in. Okay, that's lined up nicely, so we've got to put a 20 degree bend in that. So one of the things I like to use is this little magnetic angle finder. As you can see, it gives you the angle. Now, because of the way this has been made and the way the little fixture gets held in the vise, it's actually quite a steep angle, sort of this way. So I need to zero it on the flattest bit we've got here and then we'll go 20 degrees from there. So get that on there. There's our zero and we need to go twenty there. Right. Let's put the bend on. Right, I think before we bend that um, we'll just put a little bit of protective paper on the back. Keep the worst of the sort of scoring that you get. Okay. Maybe a bit tighter. I think that's. I think it's taking the bend at the edges, but not so much in the middle. Let's go again. No, that is not liking that. Okay, I've 
just um, adjust the, the this lower jaw so it's in line. You can see with the fixed jaw back there, it was slightly low, and as you can see, it's starting to make it lift and do funny things. So I don't know why it slipped, but obviously it's back in position now. I've got it all tightened up, so let's bend it again. Mm, bit better. Been back and forth a couple of times just tweaking it and trying to get it as close as I can. All right, let's, I'm not going to go for half degree, that'll be fine. And then I think this time we probably should be about on it. It's a bit hard because the edge is a bit short there. 20.5. I think we were 0.5 anyway, weren't we? Do you know what? I think we'll go with that. Right, let's bend the other edge. That should go a little easier because there's less to bend. Six. Twenty-seven. Let's see. Let, let's go with that, shall we? Let's double check. We're back at zero. They're yeah, pretty close, aren't we? Okay. Right. Let's get this out. Bracket, as you can see, it was uh, struggling a bit on this two millimeter aluminium over such a length. Probably a bit of the limit, really. Ah, but it did it. We'll just uh, clean this up, and then we can put the rivets in. Okay, so now we're getting ready to put the rivets in those holes. Now, I'm just double checking I'm putting them in the right side. Because that would be annoying. And if you haven't seen them before. That's what a rivet looks like. That bag. So you can get them all different sizes, I'll show you the kit in a minute. Now these are M5 and what you may be able to see just at the far end there, or maybe that way. So there's a little thread in there and then you can see this sort of uh, ridged area here and this is the bit that collapses and it's a little bit like um, a pop rivet in some ways but it leaves you behind a thread uh, but hopefully nothing breaks uh, like a pop rivet would when you put that in. Um, so the idea is that this goes in through a hole. Now in this case I've got access to both sides, you could nut and bolt it but I think this will be a little bit neater, a bit easier just to put the screws from one side. But of course the obvious advantage of this is also that you can put it into a blind hole, this might be into a box section that's hidden away uh, in a vehicle or in another structure or behind a panel or something. Um, and so you can, what the way it works is, you've got this mandrel, I'll show you that in a minute, and it pulls the back of the thread and that makes this end collapse, this bit here. I'll note where those ridge bits are, and that collapsed area spreads out and it grips into the hole to, a, to an extent. You know, if you over torque this, it will spin, um, and it should stay in there. And it gives you uh, basically a deep thread into an otherwise quite thin bit of material. So, let me show you the tool. Okay, so this is the Rivnet kit I've got. There's a couple of different styles you can get A and B. I've got B, but I've had this a little while and Actually, I think the A's got some advantages to it because the main difference I can see between them is on type A, you've got these very long mandrels like this. So I've got M3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, and 12. Oh, the 12's fallen down, okay. Uh, I mean, an M2 
12 Rivner, if you you really got to be um, going some to want to put that into a structure, ideally you'd tap in an M12 hole. But anyway, we've got it there, and then we've got the, all the like adapter nuts that you need to take each of those mandrels. So this is the mandrel, um, and so this is the bit where you put the Rivner on, and then it kind of grips here, the spring-loaded bit, and essentially you end up pulling this mandrel down, but holding, holding the other part that's all there, and it squashes the part in, and then you unscrew it out, and away you go. Uh, now the downside of this style is if you if it breaks here because this is very thin and I have broken my M5 one and I had to repair it. Um, then you basically you got to machine the whole of this because I did ask the suppliers if you can get hold of these mandrels and um, the one I bought this off I went back to them and they didn't have any they don't sell that. But for the Type A this is modular so you get this as a standard and then you just as far as I can see you just get the bits that go on the end so you just get your three four five six eight whatever threaded part here and you screw that on and then if it breaks you've only got a really you could if you've got a lathe you can just easily turn that because it's a relatively simple uh piece that goes on the end there so i've got the m5 mandrel in there and it starts there and it runs all the way through back to this little knob back here and when i rotate that uh, you might not be able to see but it's turning that as well and it just runs freely in there there's a spring in there as well um, there's a couple of features that might not immediately be obvious, but there's a little lock ring here and you can move this piece relative backwards and forwards. And the basic idea is to sort of limit the travel uh, because you've got, as you can imagine, this lever ratio is enormous. And as I found out to my cost, you see that's a stainless steel bit of stud. I've had to repair this. If you, if you pull too hard, you're just trying to get that last bit of squeeze on it. Um, you're only pulling on this M5 rod or even an M4 if it's the smaller one. It's very easy to break those. So it's best to set this as a kind of limit to how far you can go. So in this material, as a bit of a guide, I'm using three millimeters as my set. So I've opened it up fully, and then I've basically undone that, wound this out, which moves this stop, this piece back here. It doesn't touch that, but moves this. And then I'll put this on fully until it's just on the end there. And then I'll measure that, make sure it's around, around three millimeters so there and that means when I when I pull the handles in if you can see it brings it towards it there's a lot of free play that last bit until I get pull this fully home that should be enough to crush this without breaking it and applying too much load uh, there's lots of ways to do it that's the way I've kind of settled on uh, just to avoid breaking that uh, you can of course because essentially what you're doing is basically pulling that thread to make make this flare out and make that joint so really or you could just use um, just a stock piece of tube and um, just hold that and then just wind a bolt into it you know and pull it anything really to pull it in but this just makes it a little bit more convenient and then you know you really go to town and get the pneumatic electric and all the rest of it but I think this is a nice I think it's about 25 pounds so um, I had it a little while but I was using it um, and did break it recently so just watch out for that right let's get uh, our rivenet set and we'll get them in And then basically pull the handles together. And it can be a bit tricky just to keep it straight. Especially as I've got the camera in the way. As you can see, as I pull it, and then we unscrew this, which is unscrewing the whole mandrel out the back of it. Hopefully, a reasonably good thread. Now, obviously, you know, with enough torque, that will spin and break away. Uh, but we're in two millimeter aluminium, so hopefully, that's got a quite good grip, you know, and it's doing pretty light duty. Right, let's get the other ones done, then we'll bring you back. And there we have the finished piece. So you can see the rivets on the back there. So it will go on that way round. All right, so all we need now is a bit that this bolts to. Ah, I, right, I just filmed that last bit, switched the camera off, thought, let's just double check this, offered it up to the machine, and thought, hang on, these are in backwards. 
they should be on this side. And if you remember this clip, okay, so now we're getting ready to put the rivnuts in those holes. Now I'm just double checking I'm putting them in the right side. That would be annoying. Yeah. Okay, well, only one thing to do, drill them out, turn them, put new ones in this side and get us back on track. Hmm. Now I could say, I did this on purpose to show you how to rectify things like that. Ah! It's not going well, is it? Or could be on it. <laughs> uh, just having a moment. Right. Or could be honest and say, yeah, I messed up. Let's get it sorted out. I can even hold that. Let's try that. Okay, by the magic of YouTube, uh, I've now taken them all out, which was fun, and inserted them the correct way around this time. So, there they are. So I'll just show you how this goes on the machine, and then we need to make the big piece that this connects to. Okay, I've just pushed this in loosely behind there, I haven't put the holes in it yet. And again, this is just a practice piece, I think I'm going to need a longer one, so I'll get that there. And then the piece we just made, that will go onto that big block on there. And because of this 20 degree angle here and here, that will basically bring it back again, just give maximum space. And then this will curl around in itself like that. Let's show you the side view. Let's go on like that. And then we'll just be, well, something. These are a bit long, but oh, something like that. Either like that, or maybe. Oh, it's just out of frame, sorry, there we go. I like that all the way along, or maybe I'll make up a strip that's continuous just so I get the maximum contact area, because eventually this will kind of try to want to, or want to uh, wear and break three around that joint. And then, anyway, that will go on there like that. And because it's doubled back on itself, it should go up and down quite nicely. Yeah, that's what I was worried about there. It needs to be, needs to be kind of like that. There we go. Right, well, we can't go any further with that until we make the block that goes on there. Okay, and here's the drawing for it. So it's just got a few basic features in it, a range of holes, some of which are counterboard, some of which are just through holes. Uh, and then we've got two little pockets here that you can see in this three view. This is where the bracket we just made uh, bolts into. Then these eight here, those pick up on the linear rails. Then we've got a little cutout here because this is where another piece comes forward uh, that supports the quill and then the two triangular brackets go into these holes here. So in terms of cam, uh, we'll just peck out not full depth but partial depth. I don't like going 20 millimeters with such a, a small end, uh, small twist drill just in case it gets jammed in there. So we'll just peck drill these just to a certain depth uh, then I think we machine these pockets out. Now to do that I had to create some extra CAD in Fusion 360, it was a little bit wider than this, just to make sure I could definitely get into each of the, you know, fully machine off the edge of the here, otherwise it'd leave a little corner in there. So we did that, and then I think the last thing to do is then we bolt it down using the centre fixings, because then we need to rough cut it out and then do a finished profile pass around there. That's kind of it really. So let's head over to the CNC machine.
Okay, that didn't go so well, did it? So the reason was I had this uh, three flute cutter in there that I use for steel and cast iron and things like that. And it's had a lot of uh, abuse and uh, it's pretty blunt. So as soon as I heard that, I slowed the feed rate right down, let it continue. So it's taken those two pockets out. So, but no harm done. Um, I swapped it over for a pretty new two flute cutter. So that should be okay in aluminium. And uh, once we bored out some of these holes and I get to the perimeter, I should be able to speed it back up again. Now, as you probably noticed, I don't have flood coolant, I don't have any mist, I don't have an air compressor, basically. And I'm thinking about it and looking into it, looking into the specs, uh, but not yet, and certainly not today, so we just need to do the best we can with what we got here. So we'll take out some of those holes, um, then I'll drill them all the way through manually, put some more screws in the inter internal holes, and then I can do the final finish pass. Machine the shape out. Right, let's get going. Oh, one more thing. Uh, yeah, you probably noticed that uh, that last bit of footage, there's a lot of camera shake when the cutters are going in certain directions. A little bit of vibration that you get in the bed or any part of the machine, if the camera's resting on it, like I might have clamped it onto here or wherever I've got it, this is only an iPhone 7, and a little bit of vibration and it makes the image stutter. So, uh, sorry about that. I don't have a really fancy camera. We've got what we got, and I'm just trying to do the best I can. That might mean I need to do some handheld shots just to get you in close, but that's what we've got at the moment. Right. Let's get on with it.
So that went reasonably well. The main problem I had was, I think these holes in here, I'm just going to have to check in the CAD, but I think these holes must be pretty close to the diameter of the cutter, because it really bogged down and it almost uh, stalled the cutter. So as you probably saw on the footage, I had to manually override and slow the feed rate right down into there, just to make sure I get through. Um, normally I make them larger than the cutter, but uh, maybe it's a little bit close. Okay, so the next thing, while it's down here, it'd be quite easy just to drill and tap these out to M5, so we'll do that next. That's where the lower plate connects. And uh, yeah, then, then we're done, we'll take it off and clean it up, and then we can go and see if it fits. So, let's get these holes tapped. Okay, and after a little bit of clean up, there it is. So we've got our recesses in there, we've got all our counter balls, the through holes, uh, we've got those little, yeah, you can see, it's chattered in there. I must have had the radius of that, the same as the end mill. I thought I'd made it a little bit larger, but uh, anyway, we've got the job done. Now we've still got to put, I think there's a couple of M8s in here, but we'll do that in a future video. We just want to make sure this is going to fit. So the first thing to check is uh, the lower plate. Right on the machine. All right. So. I haven't put any washers on these or any plates because this is just temporary. I think it's going to be too small, but at least I can just see if the idea is going to work. And we'll get a, a longer piece. That's okay. And I haven't drilled holes in the bottom. All we'll do is just pinch it in there. Something like that. Do these up at the back. Okay, there it is, it's sort of mocked up in position now. Like I say, we'll get a longer one of these, so let's uh, move this in and out. So that's, that's fully in there, and then we'll go up and down. down and that's right at the bottom so that's going to work and then when the quill goes up and down like that will be a big bracket comes off here sits into there there'll be two little triangular supports that come out there either side and then that will go up and down and that can roll round behind there. So make sure I don't go off the top. That would be bad. So it'll kind of be. I uh, can't do it, but you get the idea. Okay, I think we'll call that a success. Okay, so before we go too much further, let's just see if I really do need a longer one of these. So let's go all the way down. There and all the way forward this way, the other forward. So that's all the way down, all the way out, and then we'll move the quill up. So if this is at maximum, which is somewhere about there. Oh you know what? That might be okay. I think. 
that's the longest stretch so yeah okay it's got to go down a little bit and actually have some holes in it but I think there's enough give brilliant I think we'll run with that then Yeah, I think uh, that turned out really well. I'm really pleased with that. Uh, it was nice at that fit, and this is a nice fit in here. I think we don't need to get a longer one of those, so we'll see how we get on with that. So, I think for this video, we're done. So, I think all that remains to be said is thank you very much for watching, and see you next time. <laughs>